Once my soul was astray from the heavenly way and was wretched and vile as could be. Then my Savior in love gave me peace from above when he reached down his hand. When the Savior reached down for me, he had to reach way down for me. I was lost and undone without God or his Son when he reached down his hand. I was near to despair when he came to me there, and he showed me that I could be free. Then he lifted my feet, gave me gladness complete when he reached down his hand for when the Savior reached down for me, he had to reach way down for me. I was lost and undone without God or his Son when he reached down his hand for me. Oh, we hope we got it right. I want to preach today a little bit, turn in your Bible to an unusual verse of Scripture in 2 Timothy, in 2 Timothy, and chapter 2. I want to read one verse of Scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And verse 23, Paul is writing to the young pastor at the church of Ephesus by the name of Timothy, and he's giving him instructions as to how to conduct things in the church. And he says, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid. Look at that. Pastor, he said, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. There are foolish questions that people ask, and there are factual questions. 
that people ask. We pastors should be able to answer the factual questions from the Word of God. But foolish questions we should avoid because they stir up strife. Thank you. You're a precious man. God's going to bless you for that. Because the Bible says you give a cup of cold water, and that's cold. In the name of apostle, you'll not lose your reward. So I want to preach this morning on this subject, my most asked question. After 65 years of preaching, I've had all kinds of questions that have been put to me. Some factual, some foolish. For example, I was preaching in Columbia, South Carolina, and a gentleman came up to me and said, Pastor Barber, you seem to be a knowledgeable man. I want to ask you a big, big old question. I said, go ahead and ask. I don't have to answer, but ask. He said, where did Cain get his wife? I said, are you married? He said, yes. I said, quit worrying about Cain's wife and take care of your own wife. And the Bible doesn't tell us where Cain got his wife. We all have an opinion, but that's this it. My opinion is as good as your opinion, and your opinion is as good as my opinion, and neither one of them are worth a nickel. Questions the Bible don't answer, leave them alone. They're foolish. Amen. I've had other people ask me for Paul, the Apostle Paul. About the Apostle Paul, I had a lady ask me one time when I was in a meeting. She said, Pastor, I want to ask you a question. I said, I'll be glad to answer it. She said, and I preached along this line, and she said, I know what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. I said, you do? She said, yes, I do. I said, well, I have read every commentary that I know anything about, and I've searched and searched, and I never found out. What Paul's thorn in the flesh was, I have an opinion, but it's only an opinion, not based up by uh, factual scriptures. I said, tell me what it was. She said he had two wives. I said, my God, woman, that'd be any man's thorn in the flesh. <laughs> Foolish question. God didn't tell us what the thorn in Paul's flesh was. And then others have asked, where is heaven? There are some indications that heaven uh, are up, is upward in the north. No matter where you are, point toward the north. And there's a deep place back there in the north. I don't know that for a fact, but it's in the, in, implied in the scriptures. And a lot of Bible scholars think that heaven is upward and it's in the north. I've had others ask me, what church should I join? Now that I'm living for God, what church should I join? Well, I think you ought to join Crossroads Baptist Church. <laughs> no, I said, I think you ought to join a church that preaches the word and where the people love one another, and where you get fed. Where the man of God feeds you the word of God. And you can grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Savior. That's the kind of church you look for. Now, nowadays, I don't mind recommending a church to people, because there's a lot of churches don't preach the word of God. They don't have pastors that believe it to start with. If you don't believe it, you're not going to preach it. Say amen right there. So, I had a little girl come up to me one Sunday after the service, and she said, Pastor, said my little doggy died. I said, honey, I'm sorry. I am so sorry about your little doggy. I said, what can I do for you? She said, did my little doggy go to doggy heaven? Is there a doggy heaven? What are you going to tell a little seven or eight-year-old girl? 
I said, listen, I know one thing, that in the new world, they're going to be dog, animals. Now, hold on now. During the millennium, said a child would go out and play with the reptiles. The lion lay down. And so on, so I think my little logie, I got to get the demon out of her, but I think she's going to heaven. <laughs> So there's a lot of questions that's been asked that are foolish. But I have asked, been asked my three most asked questions I want to share with you today. And they're not foolish, they're factual. People ask me, what must I do to be saved? The Apostle Paul was asked that question in Acts chapter 16. And verse 31, by a Philippian jailer, he asked Paul, Sir, what must I do to be saved? And Paul gave him the answer. The only answer by which men are saved is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And thy house, every member of the household that believes on Jesus Christ, not because he believed, but because they believe, can be saved. And that involves two things, Paul says in Acts chapter 20. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That's found in Acts 20, 21. Paul said, this is it. This is the way you're saved. Repentance Toward God. That means you're a sinner. You acknowledge you're a sinner. You turn from your sins and turn to God and believe on His Son, Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. That's the plan of salvation. That's the answer to the question, what must I do to be saved? It didn't say go get baptized or go join a church or learn the catechism or do good works. It said believe on Christ. Christ is salvation. He is salvation. And so, you need to understand the way to be saved is simply to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only way. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus said. You can't get to God except by Christ and through Christ. Man is religiously incurable. And all of man's history, he's been seeking by his way to get to God. But he'll never get there. Only by God's way. And God's way is through Christ. You see, man is trying to get to God his way. And God comes to man his way. Through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And the second question is, not only what must I do to be saved, but now that I am saved, how can I know I'm saved? And a lot of sincere believers wrestle with the assurance of salvation. That's the reason I ask. The Hendricks to sing those three songs today, they deal with assurance. He, the Word of God is our foundation upon which we understand how we are saved. Now, God wants you to, be, to know that you're saved. God know, not only wants you to be saved, but God wants you to have the assurance to know without a doubt that you are saved. Listen what John, the beloved, said in 1 John 5. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. That's how you say it. That ye may know, not think, that ye may know whoop, that you have eternal life. And that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. 
The assurance of salvation is based on three simple things. All pointed out for us in 1 John chapter 5. It's based on the work of Christ. You ought to write these things down. If you have a Bible and write in it, you ought to write it down. The assurance of salvation comes by resting in the work of Christ. What is the work of Christ? He died for you. He died on Calvary and shed his blood. And you can't be saved no other way. A lot of folks say, you ask if they say, well, I, I feel like it. Salvation is not based on feeling. That's emotion. Nothing wrong with emotion. You don't, don't know you saved by how you feel. I've gone to church and felt some religious, felt like I could outrun angels on Sunday and on Monday. I felt like the devil got me. That's emotion. You can't base your salvation on that. You base it on the work of Christ. Praise God. I bank, I bank my eternal destiny, my eternal hope in Christ and what he did at Calvary by paying my sin there. I trust in him, praise God. So, and he says that in, chapter, in John 1, whosoever believeth, that Jesus is the Christ that is born of God. So you believe in the work of Christ. Second, your assurance comes not only by basing your salvation on the work of Christ, but it comes by basing your salvation on the witness of the Spirit. He says, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. In Romans chapter 8, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, Himself, listen to this, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Holy Spirit in your heart bears witness that you are a child of God. Now you can you can feel you can know the Spirit of God in your spirit. The Spirit of God speaks to you. He impresses you. He's a call. We call him the still small voice. Praise God. He speaks eternal things. He's the comforter, and he bears witness that you are a child of God. Therefore, you by him you cry, "But Father." And notice verse seventeen. He bears witness to three things. He bears witness to our sonship, and if children, there we are, children. He bears witness that we're children of God. You can't base your assurance on what you do or don't do. You listen to me, people. You base your assurance on the fact that the Holy Spirit in your heart bears witness that you're a child of God. He not only bears witness that you're a child of God, a son of God, but he bears witness that you're heirs of God. That you're children of God and heirs of God. And the third thing, join heirs with Christ. You know what that means? I'm a joint heir with Jesus. All that Jesus has. I'm a joint heir to it. What the book says. And we'll get that by and by. But not only that, he bears witness to that we're glo we glorified. Our glory ship. Our sonship, our heirship, our glory ship is all witnessed in our heart by the Holy Spirit. I want to ask you, if you're honest this morning, if you saved, if you're honest with yourself, the Holy Spirit of God's telling you you're going to make it. <laughs> that you're going to be in glory when this thing's all done and said, said and done. Amen? So you base the assurance of your salvation 
on the work of Christ and the witness of the Spirit and the Word of God. The Word of God. This Word, says, he says here, that this is the record that God hath given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. All of these blessed truths are found in 1 John chapter 5. This is a record, John said, that God has given us this eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Notice what he says here. Whosoever is born of God, in verse 4, overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, folks, you may not can believe people, but you can believe this book. And this book says plain and simple that if you exercise your faith in Jesus Christ, you say, how much faith do I have to have? How little or how much? It don't matter. Now listen to me. It don't matter the degree of your faith. It matters the object of your faith. If you have a little faith and you put it in Jesus, you'll be just as saved as a man who, or the woman who has great faith and puts it in Jesus. Because after all, it's said and done, saving faith is a gift of God. It comes from God. God gives you the faith to believe in His Son. Hallelujah. He gave His Son, then gave you the faith to believe in Him. Praise God. And then gives you salvation when you do believe in Him. Hallelujah. Salvation is of the Lord. Amen. So, our first question most ask is, what must I do to be saved? second question is, how may I know I'm saved? And third question is, now that I am saved, what should I do? I want to mention three things you ought to do. You ought to be a worshiper. You ought to be a worshiper. God demands and God deserves our worship. We're here today not just to see one another. We're not here just to compliment wrote. Crossroads Church. We're here to meet. Hallelujah. In the presence of God Almighty. And offer Him our praise and our worship. In song and in sermon and in fellowship. We give worship to God. And may I say this. Any person that don't have a de doesn't have a desire to worship God has never been born again. I didn't say any person don't have a desire to go to a certain church or whatever. That's a different sub subject. But the question is, we ought to worship God. And you ought to be in a place where you can worship God. Amen. You go to some churches and say amen like you're saying around here, and they'll lead you out of there. Like the old man, the old sinner got saved by the grace of God, and he was just a down and out sinner, and God saved him by his wonderful grace. He'd never been to church, didn't know anything about church, but he knew he ought to go to church. And he went to this highfalutin church on Sunday, and he went in there and sat down, and people kind of looked at him when he was come in. They had preferred he not be there. But he was not one of their kind. But anyway, the old fellow was so excited about being saved, he just sat there, and the service got started. And they sung a song about Jesus. And he said, Amen. Everybody in the house turned around and looked where that strange noise come from. Stared at the man. Scared some of them to half to death. You ever been like that? A few minutes the preacher got up and began to read his scripture and began to preach. He began to magnify some things about Jesus. And old preacher said, Amen, hallelujah. And that fellow said, Amen, hallelujah. And the preacher motioned for the deacon steward that meant to go get that fellow out of here. He went back to him and said, Sir, said, you'll have to, you'll have to be quiet. You're disturbing the preacher. 
He said, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to disturb the preacher. But I just wanted to say amen. He said, well, he said, I'm excited about being saved. He said, I've been saved. I got religion. He said, well, you didn't get it here. <laughs> we want to worship. Amen. And we worship differently. We we have different we have different person. I get a little loud and I want to lift my hand and slap my feet and holler sometimes. And I worship. Some of you just want to sit and cry and sit and smile and shake your head. Whatever however you express your feelings is not my business. It's your business. But as long as you worship God, that's what counts. I'll tell you one thing, you won't resent other folks doing it. You don't like the way I preach and hoot and holler and worship. They got a lot of other places around this county you can go and you won't get there. Amen. <laughs> Brother told me one time when I was pastor of the he said, You a little bit I don't emotional for us. But don't you think you've been here long enough? You you preach a lot of meetings. Don't you think you ought to go into evangelism? Move. I said, brother, if there's any moving done between you and I, you will do it. Because I've got my furniture screwed to the floor. And it won't cost us but one thing for you to move, and that's a stamp on your letter. And I stayed there 41 years, and he managed to stay another six months, and he moved. <laughs> Amen. God, don't think you're going to intimidate me for worshiping God. I worship God. They were, I got saved in an old-fashioned Holy Ghost Baptist church where sinners believed in worshiping God, and I've been in it ever since, and they don't intend to get out of it. I found that when I get to heaven, praise God, I'm going to stand by the door. And when some of you quiet Baptists come in and you see all that's there, and you throw up your hands and holler, hallelujah, I'm going to run up in your face and say, I told you so, I told you so. Amen. Yeah, what should I do now that I'm saved? You ought to be a worshiper. Second, you ought to be a witness. You ought to be a witness. We're salt. In light. And Jesus said, Ye are my witnesses. Lord, let this world know, praise God, we believe in God and we believe in Christ. I want to tell you something. All this mess that's going on today, a lot of folks hollering everything under God's high heaven. We ought to holler, I'm one of Jesus' followers. Amen. Praise God. Yes, sir. Let people know I'm not ashamed of Jesus. I want to be a witness to him. And what you, as a witness, you affect people. A witness does two things. They either touch persons to come to God or to go from God. They either, they are, they're either a testimony for a man's salvation for a man's damnation. Paul said you're living epistles, known and read of all men. And in that context, he said... We are a savior of life unto life and death unto death. That's what that means. We ought to be witnesses. And third, we ought to be workers. Amen. We ought to be work. We don't work to get saved, but we work because we are saved. Yes, sir. I appreciate those workers around this church. I will, and the rest of you. A lot of you do things that never get recognized. I appreciate you playing that piano. I appreciate you playing that organ. I appreciate you leading the singing. You don't do too good a job, but I appreciate it anyway. I'm just teasing you. I'm just, if he gets mad, I'll pray for him. I appreciate you singing and leading. I, as teachers, I appreciate all of you do some things for Jesus. Those that clean up, Brother Eric, I appreciate you. and People clean up these grounds and everything. Amen? Do it for Jesus. <laughs> Not do, if you do it for one another, if you do it for the church, it'll get burdensome. But praise God if you do it for Jesus.
my most past testament. Pretty factual, whole lot of fooling. I know what to do with the foolish ones, the Lord them. And I know what to do with the factual ones. A- answer them. Answer them from this book. Amen. All right, y'all come now. Careless soul, why will you linger? Wandering from the fold of God, hear you not the invitation, or oh, prepare to meet thy God. Careless soul, no heed the warning, for your light will soon be gone. Oh, how sad to face a judgment, unprepared to meet thy God. Why so thoughtless are you standing? Why the bleeding years go by, and your life is spent in folly? Oh, prepare to meet thy God. Hear you not the earnest pleadings of your friends that wish you well. And perhaps before tomorrow you'll be called to meet your God. Careless soul, oh, heed the warning. For your life will soon be gone. Oh, how sad to face a judgment unprepared to meet thy God. If you spurn the invitation till the Spirit shall depart, then you'll see your sad condition unprepared to meet thy God. Careless soul, oh, heed the warning, for your life will soon be gone. Oh, how sad to face a judgment unprepared to meet